Welcome to Gillette Stadium. My name is John Rook. I'm the voice of the Patriots here at Gillette Stadium. And, and I feel like something's missing. I feel like we need a little charge today. So how about just to sort of set the tempo for the day and for the coming weeks and days and everything else on the schedule this year, how about one that they can hear us in down in Miami and they can certainly hear us over in New York? That's good for another Patriot. That was actually impressive. That's a good job out of you. Good job out of you. I want to welcome each and every one of you to the Hall of Patriot Plays presented by Raytheon for this year's Hall of Fame induction ceremonies. I think it's absolutely fantastic that the Kraft family and the Patriots honor their alumni with a formal ceremony like this. And I love that they make it free to people like me and to you to come out here and celebrate with these great players. You know, the connection between the team and the fans has always, always been of paramount importance to the Kraft family. Their Hall of Fame is just another example of that. Patriots were the first team in the National Football League to give fans the authority to make the final selections for the Hall of Fame induction here. Tonight, we're going to celebrate the careers of Gil Santos, the voice of the New England Patriots. and one of our all-time favorites, Teddy Bruschi. You know, these two men gave the Patriots and Pats fans so many unbelievable, memorable moments during their careers. It's your opportunity now to make their moment memorable for them. All right, so are you ready? No, no, that's, that's not going to do. Remember, they need to hear you in Miami. They certainly need to hear you in New York. Are you ready? Yeah. All right, what better way then to kick off things by introducing a few members of our New England Patriots? We have members of the military. We also have members of our own Patriots militia, end zone militia, ready to come out and present.
Ladies and gentlemen, this evening we are honored to welcome back dozens of Patriots alumni collectively. They represent more than 250 years of Patriot service, covering a span of 52 seasons from 1960 through 2011. Imagine the stories they can tell. The storytelling is always the highlight of these alumni events. We hope to share a few of those stories with you tonight. Please provide now a warm welcome as I introduce the alumni in attendance here this evening. Starting with our alumni whose careers began in the 1960s. Please welcome defensive end Jim Boudreaux. Defensive end Larry Eisenhower. Defensive back, Billy Johnson. Guard, Lenny St. G. Defensive tackle, Ed Toner. And punter, quarterback, Tom Yusick. From the 1970s, please welcome center Peter Brock. Linebacker Steve King. Linebacker Bill Matthews. Kicker John Smith. Wide receiver, Randy Vataha. From the 1980s, please welcome nose tackle, Tom Perrell. Defensive end, Garen Veris. Running back, John Williams. Now please welcome Teddy's teammates from the 1990s and the 2000s, beginning with linebacker Eric Alexander. Cole Ayi. Linebacker Vernon Crawford. Fullback Kyle Echo. Guard Russ Hochstein. Defensive back to Bucky Jones. Offensive tackle, Max Lane. Linebacker, Marty Moore. Defensive end, Chris Sullivan. Quarterback, Scott Zolak. And now, please welcome five of Teddy's teammates who helped him deliver three Super Bowl championships to New England. Guard, Joe Andrewsy. Linebacker Matt Chatham.
cornerback Ty Law. <laughs> Offensive tackle Matt Light. And long snapper, Lonnie Paxton. We also have five representatives of the Patriots Hall of Fame here with us tonight. Seated in the audience and representing her father, who is a member of the Boston Patriots and earned league MVP honors in 1966, please give a round of applause and a warm welcome for Rachel Nance, daughter of 2009 Patriots Hall of Famer, Jim Nance. And if you'd now turn your attention back to our red carpet entrance, he was an original member of the Boston Patriots in 1960, retired as the AFL's all-time leading scorer. He was a five-time AFL All-Star, the 1964 AFL MVP, the second Patriot to ever be inducted into the Patriot Hall of Fame in 1992, and for 28 years he teamed up with one of today's Hall of Fame honorees. Ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause for Gino Cap. Paletti. He played linebacker for the Patriots for 14 seasons, recorded over 100 tackles in nine of those years. He averaged over 10 tackles per game during his career, finished with a very patriotic 1,776 career tackles, inducted into the Patriots Hall of Fame in 93. Please welcome Steve Nelson. the franchise record holder with 100 career sacks. His 18 and a half sacks in 1984 remains a Patriot record. His 35 sacks by a linebacker over two seasons remains an NFL record today. He was one of the greatest linebackers to ever play the game. This weekend, he'll represent the Patriots once again in Canton, Ohio for their 50th anniversary celebration of the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Welcome Patriots and Pro Football Hall of Famer, Andre Tippett. He spent his entire 15-year NFL career with the Patriots, retired in 2008 as the Patriots' all-time leading receiver. He remains the team's all-time leading punt returner with 252 career returns. One year, he even finished second on the team with three interceptions. That year, he did help the Patriots win their third Super Bowl in four years, a five-time team captain, a three-time Super Bowl champion. Please welcome last year's Hall of Fame inductee, Troy Brown. Ladies and gentlemen, as Troy makes his way to his seat, it's my great pleasure now to introduce to you this evening's honorees. If you'd please turn your attention to the CBS scene video boards, 
for a brief introduction of our first honoree. 15 seconds to go. It is second and goal at the Oakland one. Logan straight back to pass. Sets it up. Rolls to the right. Looking. Ball looking. Is incomplete at the five yard he was the voice of the New England Patriots for 36 years. The legendary Gil Santos delivered the radio play-by-play -play of Patriots games to fans all over the region and beyond. The snap to Brady. Looks, stands, starts to run with it. He is down to the five, and he's in! Touchdown! Tom Brady! The Patriots are back in it. His attention to detail, his sense of the moment, and yes, his incomparable voice made those fans feel as if they were inside the stadium themselves. Paired with Patriots Hall of Famer Gino Capaletti for most of his tenure in the broadcast booth, Santos was at the mic for the greatest moments in team history. 48-yard field goal attempt. Set to go. Snap ball down. Kick up. Kick is on the way. And it is good! It's good! And the game is over! And the Patriots are Super Bowl champions! You know, there's that old saying, if you like what you do in life, you never work a day. And uh, this is really what he was all about, because he really thoroughly enjoyed it. Always uh, well prepared and ready to go. Gil Santos called 745 Patriots games, including all three Super Bowl victories. And at the conclusion of the 2012 season, as part of an on-field ceremony, Patriots owner Robert Kraft surprised Santos with the news that he would become just the second non-player to earn the honor as a contributor with a spot in the Patriots Hall of Fame. He was the voice of the Patriots and called uh, so many great plays and, um, and was part of those championships that we had. So, um, you know, I, I don't think the fans uh, will ever forget the way that he described the plays. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to introduce the 20th person and just the second non-player to earn induction into the New England Patriots Hall of Fame. Please give a round of applause for my friend and yours, the voice of the New England Patriots, Mr. Gil Santos. Good afternoon, everyone. On a beautiful late summer afternoon here in Foxborough, it's the snap to Brady. Looks, stands, starts to run with it. He is down to the five, and he's in. Touchdown, Tom Brady. Runs in for a touchdown with 7.52 to play in the football. Patriots are back in it. This one is returnable, coming right to Troy Brown at the 45. He heads left to the 50. Straight up the middle of the 45. To the 30, 25, 5, he's in. Touchdown, 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 Troy Brown. Being rushed, fires to the right. Picked up, Tyra, left side. He's going to go all the way. A pass interception return. Touchdown, Patriots. Wedger is going to stop. He is stopped. Willie McGinnis will make the stress at the one yard. Stands in the pocket, fires it to the right, down the right sideline, and caught at the 20-15, 10-5, touchdown, Patriots! 65-yard bomb, Brady to Moss, one play, bang, bang, they both set NFL records, back to throw, looks, fires, caught, touchdown, Rob Gronkowski! Ken Walter will hold, Lonnie Paxton will snap, set to go, snap, ball down, kick up, kick is on the way, and it is good! It's good! It's good! The Patriots are Super Bowl champions, the best team in the National Football League! Ha! Snap, ball down, kick up, kick is on the way, kick is good! with my favorite play, takes hey. a knee at the end of the game, and the Patriots are world champions again, 24-21, back-to-back, world championships, three out of four, yes, it's a dynasty. Once again, if you would please turn your attention now to the CBS Scene video board for a brief introduction of our final Honoree of the night. I think Teddy's everything you could ever want uh, in a player and more. Gets hit and is picked off by Teddy Bruschi at the 20, at the 15. The thing that made Teddy, Teddy different was his enthusiasm and his excitement. And nobody could bring that level of excitement every day the way Teddy did. As a coach, you try to sometimes compare players to 
this player is sort of like that player. This player reminds me of that player. I don't think I've ever compared a player to Teddy Bruschi because he was so unique. Uh, what he was, uh, there just aren't many like him. Fires, intercepted, touchdown, Teddy Bruschi! And the fans are throwing snow into the air. Selected in the third round of the 1996 draft, Bruschi scrapped his way from special teams demon to starting linebacker to pro bowler. It's just all out effort and gives you everything he's got. Bruschi ripped it out of his hands. He appeared in five Super Bowls, owns a ring from all three Patriots titles, and authored some of the iconic moments from the greatest era in team history. And the Patriots are world champions again. Seeing what he endured over the course of you know the, his career with you know the medical condition that he had and overcoming that and still coming back is really a trademark to Teddy and his mental toughness. It's got to be an emotional night for Teddy. It'll be an emotional night for the fans and has to be an emotional night for his teammates and coaches as well. Nobody deserves it more than Teddy. He was just the best player. I wish you know I could play with you know 52 other Teddy Bruskies. Blitz. Teddy Bruskies section. Clean, absolutely untouched. And he's one of the all-time great New England Patriot players on the field, off the field, as a captain, as one of the true leaders of the team. Um, I'll never forget Teddy Bruschi, and it's, it was an honor to coach Teddy. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming the 19th player and 21st person to be inducted into the Patriots Hall of Fame, Teddy Bruschi. In 1994, when the Kraft family took ownership of the Patriots, they changed the landscape of this franchise forever, both literal, literally and figuratively, I think we can all agree. At this time, it's my pleasure to introduce one of the principals credited with that transformation. He's our first presenter this evening. Please welcome Patriots President Jonathan Kraft. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. This, the, my dad and I were just sitting up here talking, looking out. Thank you. Uh, we never would have imagined back in the early 70s when we started coming to the games that something like this would be possible. And uh, you really honor us all as well as the great players from the past who were really here to celebrate with your presence. The last couple of years when we start this ceremony, we always point out the same thing, which is when we built Gillette Stadium, when we first conceived of it in the late 90s, 
Our family said to ourselves, it'll be so cool once the stadium is up and running. If we could build a Hall of Fame just for the Patriot players and contributors who laid the foundation for this franchise. And thank you. And a couple of years after Gillette was built, we were able to start on the mission to do that. And our idea was not only to build a building that could mem memorialize the amazing careers of the men that are sitting in front of us and up here on the stage, but the whole history of the team and do it in a way that was interactive and do it in a way in which many younger generations could come and experience the building. And to create a program that would do that, we teamed up with an amazing New England company, Raytheon, who is busy keeping all of the American patriots safe and in great shape overseas all over this world. And they said to us, in order to keep doing the work we do, we need great young Americans who can't play football professionally to become scientists and engineers and to embrace math. And the hall at Patriot Place presented by Raytheon uses football as a medium to help teach math and science to kids Monday through Friday, but then also memorialize the great legacy of our players. So please, when you get a chance, come visit. We're very proud of it. And if you're out here today, it means you're passionate about the team and we think you'll enjoy it. So thank you again for being here today. When I was a little boy, my mother used to tell my brothers and I we had to get up at seven o'clock for school. But I used to set my alarm starting when I was eight when I got a clock radio for 6.44 a.m. And the reason I set my clock radio for 6.44 a.m. was because there was no ESPN, there was no Comcast Sportsnet, there was no internet, there was no talk radio, sports talk radio. And I used to get my sports news from Gil Santos at quarter of the hour and at 7.15 on BZAM. The Carl D'Souza Show, for those of you older guys here. But Gil wasn't just the voice of sports for me. He was the voice of my favorite team, the New England Patriots. And when my dad started bringing myself, my brother Danny, to the games, we all used to have transistor radios because there was no delay issue with the FCC and bad words getting on, and you could actually listen and be in time with the game. And we used to sit in the stands and listen to Gil's voice, that amazing voice of power and authority, but also warmth. He welcomed you in. You felt like you were listening to a member of your family, and he knew the game of football. And with his amazing partner, Gino, they told the story of the Patriots for many, many, many years. And my favorite Gil story as it relates to the team is a year after we bought the club, uh, well, the end of 94, the first year we owned the team, our radio deal was coming up for the 95 season. And we felt that the right thing to do for the fan base of New England, it hadn't been done in the NFL yet, was to put the team on FM radio. FM was the future. It provided a much better sound quality. You could feel the game through the radio. And when we sat down with the people at WBCN to start the negotiations, we said, we have one thing that will cause us to walk away from the table, and it's a pretty aggressive ask. And that is that a gentleman who's on a competing radio station, because in those days, WBZ was owned by a separate company than the one that owned WBCN, we said, Gil Santos is going to keep his morning radio job there but he has to be the voice of the Patriots, and he has to come with his partner, Gino. In today's world, where you see guys from all different medias, media outlets cross-promoting, it's, it's not a strange thing. In those days, it was unheard of. And uh, fortunately, Mel Carmazan and Tony Berardini agreed with uh, my dad and I. And uh, 
that, that allowed Gilsit, allowed the Patriots to go to FM radio, which we think is part of what changed the face of this franchise, and allowed the greatest play-by-play -play caller in football history uh, to take his great pipes to the FM dial. He has called 745 games for the Patriots out of 746 possible games. He's called 33 of our 41 playoff games. And most importantly, he has called plays of every single player who is in this hall, every single one, and for at least the next 15, if not 20 years, that'll be the case also. It is a true honor and privilege to now call up the man who forever, there'll be others who call the games, but the man who will forever be the voice of the New England Patriots, Gil Santos. Just give me a moment here, please. I uh, have a few thousand chosen words to say. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna keep you here all day, believe me. But uh, first of all, thank you all for being here. Nice crowd. <laughs> Today, uh, quite frankly, is the high point of my broadcast career of more than 50 years, to be selected to the Patriots Hall of Fame. I want to thank Robert Kraft, Jonathan, the Kraft family. I want to thank Bill Belichick, his assistant coaches, all the Patriots players, all of the previous coaches, assistants, players, over 36 years. It's a lot of years and a lot of players and a lot of games. But let me assure you, it was never a job. It was an honor. It was a privilege. And I'm delighted to have been able to do it for all that time. Now, <clears throat> there are several other people I have to thank. My wife of 52 years, Roberta, sitting right down there. We started dating when I was 19 and she was 17. So she's put up with me for a long time. And she should be in the Wives Hall of Fame. <laughs> and she was there at the beginning of my broadcast career in uh, dusty high school gymnasiums and open air football stadiums sitting out in the crowd and getting rained on. She's been there with, it, with me through it all, the highs, the lows, the good, the bad, and I love her very, very much. I want to thank my children. My son, Mark, who works at the Hall of Fame, and now that I'm in there, he'll never be able to get away from me. Our daughter, Kathy, and our two beautiful grandchildren, Jacob and Hannah. I want to thank them, along with my relatives who are here, and my close friends for all of their love and support over all the years. I also want to thank everybody that worked with me on the broadcasts. Gino Capaletti, of course. Scott Zolak. Mark Capello, our great producer. Roger Holman, our terrific statistician. Dennis Knutson, our engineer. Just a bunch of great guys because I can assure you of this. No one gets into any Hall of Fame anywhere by himself. You gotta be part of something. And we were part of a broadcast team and we had a lot of fun describing a lot of games and came up with three Super Bowl championships. Now I've just got a few more things I wanna mention. First of all, I'm a first generation American. My parents were born in Portugal, they came to America, met here. 
and married here. And uh, when I was a kid, I didn't learn to speak English until just before I went to the first grade because our grandfather, my grandfather lived with us and he didn't speak English, so in the house we spoke Portuguese. So they taught me to speak English just before I went to the first grade and I find it ironic that uh, 60 some odd years later, I'm going into the Patriots Hall of Fame for my ability to speak English. <laughs> And I'll tell you this, I, I always wanted to be a, a sports announcer. I was 10 years old, <clears throat> listening to a Rose Bowl game on a January 1st afternoon in Fairhaven, and it was snowing. And the Rose Bowl game came on late afternoon, and Mel Allen was the play-by-play -play man, who I thought was the greatest of all time. And Mel Allen said, you know, good afternoon, everyone, from sunny Pasadena, California. It's the Rose Bowl game between, I don't know, Ohio State and Southern Cal. It's a beautiful day here. It's 80 degrees, sunshine. We're going to have a great day for football. I'm looking out the window and it's snowing, and I'm thinking, now that's the job I want. <laughs> and so, all these years later, I got it. I had a school teacher who had a premonition of this, I think. His name was Walter Wood. And at Fairhaven High School, he was the assistant principal and uh, was my physics teacher. And he had a booming basso profundo voice that scared the life out of you. Well, whenever my parents, my parents would always go to parent-teacher night at the schools. Right through grammar school and on through high school, and I always had to go with them. And they would tell the teacher, whoever it was, you can say whatever it is you want to say about Gilbert because he's standing right here and we want him to hear it from you. So Mr. Wood said to my parents, on this particular night, I was a senior in high school, he said, you know, Gilbert's not a bad boy. He doesn't get into any trouble. He said, but every time I turn around from the blackboard, he's blah, blah, blah to the guy on his right, and blah, blah, blah to the one on his left, and blah, blah, blah to the one behind him. I don't know what he's going to do for a living, but if he can get a job going blah, 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 he'll be fine. <laughs> True story. It's been a great and wonderful ride for 36 years. I said it was never a job. It was always an honor and a privilege. Number one on my game list, the Super Bowl 36 win over the Rams. Number two, the Oakland game. Numbers three and four, the next two Super Bowl wins, and all the other games are tied for fifth place. I could not have done it without the support of my loving family, my wife, my children, my grandchildren. My friends, my relatives, people all were very kind to me over the years and encouraged me. I would like to close by saying this. A couple of years ago, I was reading an article, and the article was um, about life in general. And the gentleman who wrote the article, at the end of it, posed a question to everybody who read it. And the question was, can you sum up your life in six words. And I thought about that for 10 seconds and I said, absolutely, I can sum up my life in six words. I am a very lucky man. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Gil. At this time, I'd like to ask fellow Patriots Hall of Famers Gino Capoletti, Steve Nelson, and Andre Tippett to come to the stage for a little bit of a panel discussion. And please welcome to lead that discussion Patriots radio analyst on 98.5 The Sports Hub, Scott Zolak. Zo, it's your show. All right. Is this on? There we go. All right, folks. This is our favorite time of year because that means the NFL season is about getting ready to kick off as we induct Gil Santos into the Hall of Fame here. First of all, before we get to Gil and Gil personally, I'd like to 
congratulate you. Uh, and working with you for two years, and of course, Gino Capaletti two years ago. But I tell you what, everything you just heard from Gil Santos right there, that's what we got every, every breakfast prior to the start of every NFL kickoff that Sunday. So that's what I'll miss the most. And Roberta, the snowstorms and how he told the stories of what, 17 years old, you used to walk, what, 20 miles and you made 17 cents on the dollar. <laughs> we'll miss those days. Uphill both, both ways. Both ways against the wind. Gil, you said 36 years, your most memorable call obviously was probably the first Super Bowl, the kick. Yeah. Talk okay. us through what transpired right prior to that kick. You and Gino, anything said between you two? How did you get ready before Adam drilled it? Um, actually, I just, I, I, I didn't prepare myself or anything. I hadn't thought of anything to say. I hadn't obviously written anything down. Uh, you know, didn't know it was going to come down to that. So I just gathered my thoughts and we talked and I guess it was a commercial break and we came back on. And I did what I always did uh, and that is call the play. You know, where's the ball? How long is the kick? The snap, the ball is down, the kick is up, it's on its way, you wait, bang, it was good. And then I went out of my mind. I mean, <laughs> it, it was, it guy, was right? the most exciting moment of over 50 years of broadcasting. And I cried. And I turned and hugged my paisan, and we were both crying. We had a good time. And that's the best thing for radio, right, Gino? That, it, it was just a, just a hug, I can assure you. <laughs> All right, we've heard the stories, too, of broadcasting. Gil thanked everybody with the broadcast team, because I tell you what, it's not like we just show up. Yeah, we actually do show up. Um, funniest story off broadcast that transpired during it. You told us a New Orleans one where you called the game on the phone. Because oh, the yeah. what, What's your favorite funniest story off air? Okay. Uh, off the air? Well, even oh, on air. Oh, on the game. A couple of good mistakes. ones. Off the air was the, the New Orleans thing. Uh, Gino and I were in the old uh, Sugar Bowl Stadium. Tulane, uh, Tulane Stadium, rather. Um, and that's where they used to play the Sugar Bowl. Yeah. And our engineer didn't show up. Uh, but at that time... We used to hire an engineer uh, to show up on the road with the equipment and set everything up, and we'd broadcast the game. So we get in the booth like two hours before the game, and there's no engineer. So I called the radio station, said there's no engineer, and they said, uh, well, here's his name and phone number. So I called the guy's house, and his wife said he had gone fishing. <laughs> I said, well, he's supposed to be here engineering this game. And I said, I'm sorry, I, I, I can't get a hold of him. Didn't have cell phones, obviously. So I go to the next booth, which was the New Orleans radio booth, and I told the engineer my problem. I said, I don't have any equipment. Can you get me something? Yeah, we'll send over a, a, a little a remote box and a couple of microphones, but don't you dare hook it up. Don't you dare hook it up because that's a union job. I said, don't worry about a thing. So <laughs> cab shows up. Uh, I send uh, Jimmy DeFrank went down, got the equipment, brought it up. I locked the door. Hooked it up, because I had hooked up all my broadcast equipment when I was doing high school games. I know how to do that. Hooked it up, the guy's pounding on the door, screaming and yelling, going to turn me in. And I kept the door locked, and we did the game. But we started the game on the telephone. The game was already underway by the time I got the equipment. So I've got the, the telephone the thing in my it. hand, and, and I'm game. talking, and I'm saying, Gino, Gino, ba -ba 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 -ba. and it was, it was crazy. <laughs> but the funniest thing that ever happened on the air... John Morris. Gino had decided to go to the coaching. John Morris came in as my uh, broadcast partner, and we were in Cincinnati playing the Bengals. And Pat Horn was the Patriots PR guy, and late in the first half, one of the Patriots goes in, was injured. I'm not sure which one it was. And one of the starters. He goes out of the game, and Pat comes back in at halftime, just as we're going back on the air to tell us uh, something about some other player. And on the air, I just turned around and said, Pat, what's the story with so-and-so? Is he going to play in the second half? And Pat said, I don't think so. And I said, what's his injury? And Pat said, he has a bleeding nose. And John Morris said, a bleeding nose? What is this, a baseball game? <laughs> I, I must have laughed for five minutes, knowing how John thought about baseball and baseball players. Anyway, long story short, that was it. All right, Gino, 28 years. How special is it to be... To have this guy inducted into the Hall of Fame, he's got a red jacket now. 
Take us back to that late December game when the Kraft family called you guys down. This guy thinks he's just getting a football, and they tell him he's going to be inducted. Uh, you're so right. <clears throat> Gil didn't realize at first what had happened, and I could see it coming, and I just grabbed him and gave him a big hug. We were on the field of play at uh, halftime or pregame, I guess it was, and uh, Gil was notified that he was going into the Patriots Hall of Fame. And I must say this, uh, I just have been so enamored with the way the Kraft family has done things as far as the stadium is concerned, but especially the Hall of Fame. I mean, to, uh, to have something as big as that and b making it even bigger with each passing year, you just have to take your hat off to them for having the Patriots Hall of Fame. Very well said. And getting back to uh, the game that Gil called for the championship game, uh, I, I'm a little bit of a softy. I, I know that Shock. I don't come across that way. But I am a little softy because when Adam Vinatieri kicked that field goal to win the first Super Bowl in Patriots history, I just kind of sat there and I became very pensive. And I got back to Gil when Mark Capello and the gang, Dennis and all of them were jumping around back and forth. And I just stayed there kind of uh, like thoughtless. But I was thinking about something very important. And that was to the pioneering of this franchise. And I had to think about <clears throat> the many players who came through, who stayed, some left and uh, all the ones that contributed to this franchise. And I thought about all my friends and teammates, the starters as well as the backups, and uh, I just thought that, uh, fellas, wherever you are, here we are right now with the world's championship. And that was so becoming to me. Then came the hug of Mr. Gil Santos. But uh, that, that was my true feeling at that point. All right, good stuff, Gino. Let's move on to Steve Nelson. And, Nelly, my favorite memory, the snow plow. Of course, you clapping, wearing a number 57. You're one of the more fun-loving guys. What's your favorite call either one of these two guys had? Favorite moment on the field, off the field, maybe traveling with these guys on the plane? Well, uh, first of all, um, sometimes you don't realize how good a thing you got until it's gone. But I, I think we all enjoyed Gil and Gino for so many years. And... Uh, what a pair. You know, Gino was an original Patriot. He uh, should be in the NFL Hall of Fame. He's one of the greatest players that ever put on a Patriot uniform. And then you got a guy who was born and blessed with pipes that nobody else has. Maybe Luther Vandross, but... <laughs> and, uh, I don't have anything to do with it, believe me. And to have them such, uh, you know, good friends and, and had a very colorful... Obviously, franchise of the Patriots in the 60s and 70s and 80s, and then to have such a dynasty in the early 2000s. And, um, you know, I don't think any city or any franchise city, Scott, can enjoy a pair like these two. And now you are the next generation. and Big shoes to hope fill. You got big shoes, but I uh, hope 30 years from now we'll be here with you too. But uh, I bet the, the, the snowplow game was interesting because of the 0 0 game, and, uh, you know, it was a blizzard. Uh, the Miami Dolphins were a good football team, and we were, we were a good football team at the time. And, um, you know, it was hard to get a first down, but we finally got down in, into field goal uh, position. And uh, we had a guy on work release who was, uh, his responsibility was to clean the, the yard lines. And I think Ron Meyer had kind of signaled him in to kind of, you know, brush a path where the ball was going to be placed, and he did perfectly, you know, like seven yards behind the uh, ball, and he went in there, and uh, it's funny, Don Shula was the coach of the Miami Dolphins, and he was the uh, coach of the year the year before, and as Mark Henderson, you know, went from our sideline to the Miami, Miami Dolphins sideline, and then towards the end zone, Shula yelled at him, and Henderson turned around and flipped him off, and which was kind of cool because the Hall of Fame coach getting flipped off by a uh, a guy who was uh, on the maintenance program with the Patriots, but that obviously was the play. Uh, the game ended up three to nothing, and uh, it was one of those games you always remember because it was, 
you know, not only the score, but the conditions you played in and uh, obviously that one play. It right, must have been interesting to call that one, Gil. Plus, you could see the, uh, the actual snow plows hanging in the hall. So if you haven't been to the hall, what is that, level two, Mr. Kraft? Level two, level three up top? Get your picture taken next to it. All right, let's move on to Hall of Famer, NFL Hall of Famer, Andre Tippett. And Tip. Andre Tippett is heading out to Canton for the 50th anniversary of the NFL Hall of Fame. Big tip, one of the big things about Hall of Fame weekend, you get around with all the guys, you get to tell stories. Give the Patriots Nation a little bit of what you'll be talking about when you head out to Canton here in a week. Well, it, uh, it's a really exciting time, especially celebrating the 50th uh, of the Pro Football Hall of Fame. And me representing the New England Patriots and the New England community, it gives me a lot of joy every time I get on the airplane and I walk out there. So I do that on behalf of all of you all here that support the New England Patriots and, and what the Hall of Fame stands for. Um, I always like to talk about the Pro Football Hall of Fame being football royalty. And that's what it is because you look at some of the greatest guys that ever played the game, they're all there and uh, it's the coolest thing. Um, my first year, actually I'm celebrating my fifth year of being uh, at the Pro Football Hall of Fame. And I remember it like it was yesterday when Deacon Jones got up and they have this Ray Nitsky luncheon where he welcomes the whole class in there. So I think what I can do now is share a little bit with you all that are here today as we celebrate our Pro, our Patriots Hall of Fame. And I'll tell it to you guys like Deacon told it to us. Welcome to the Patriots Hall of Fame, Teddy and Gil. And I want you to look around. You don't see any a-holes. You don't get cut from this team. And you're part of this team for the rest of your life. So welcome to the Hall of Fame. Well said, Tip. All right, I'm going to throw it back to Gil. And not that this is the last time we'll hear from Gil Santos, but... Gil, to, sum, to put it in summary, what, what are you going to miss most about calling Patriots games? The game. The game. Once it starts, um, I, I've told many people this. When I was broadcasting a football game, Patriots game, I was never more comfortable at anything in my life than at that time. When the game started, I was in a comfort zone. I loved what I did. I'd have done it for free. I never told my bosses that, <laughs> obviously, but it was just, it was a zone to get into, and it was, it was fun, and I will just miss doing the games very, very much. I will also miss the wonderful restaurants that uh, Gino and I used to go to, and that now you and I went to with all the guys, and just the camaraderie of the, of the broadcast crew. It was uh, a lot of fun. It was a great way to make a living. All right, thank you, Gil Santos. Let's give it up for Gil as we get ready to induct Teddy Bruschi next. Let's turn it back over to Mr. John Rook. Let's clear the stage, gents. Good stuff, Gil. Congratulations. How about one more round of applause for Gil Santos? Ladies and gentlemen, as I'm sure you're aware, this year marks the 20th season of ownership for the Kraft family. Franchise's worst to first transition under his leadership is well documented. The team's sustained success is unrivaled in the free agency era of pro football. In the past 19 seasons, Patriots fans have celebrated more wins, 225, more playoff victories, 20, more division championships, 12, more conference crowns, six, and more Super Bowls, three, than any other team in the National Football League. All of which was made possible 
because of the vision and investment made by this man, it's an honor to introduce our next presenter, Patriots Chairman and CEO, Mr. Robert Kraft. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, John, and thanks to all of you for coming out here today. Um, and, you know, I started thinking, you know, how you attract a few thousand fans to come to the Patriot Hall of Fame presented by Raytheon? You offer them a brewski. I hope that's politically correct. It is. Okay. You know, listening to Gil, I was just thinking, this is the fifth, this is the brewski season of the Patriots. It's the 54th season that the Patriots are in business. You know, it's great to have all the brewskis here this evening his lovely wife, Heidi, and their three growing boys, TJ, Rex, and Dante. And I think one of the lasting memories of Super Bowl 39 for all of us was seeing Teddy romping on the field with TJ and Rex. And uh, what a great beginning that was and what a great ending. So. Thanks, guys, for giving us that great memory. You know, in the six years that we've hosted this Hall of Fame ceremony, this is by far the largest crowd that we've ever had. So why don't you all give yourselves a round of applause, and thank you very much for being here. And I also want to thank all of our past players who created this great history of the team. And we had the privilege of sitting in the old Foxborough Stadium and watching the legacy that you all created for us so that we could have this uh, Hall of Fame by, by Raytheon. And, you know, we really did it to create a legacy where all the memories could be remembered for many generations of fan to come. I would like to ask all the Patriot Hall of Famers and alumni to please stand once again so that our fans can express their appreciation to you. Please, all of you. Once again, our family has been privileged to have a great 20 years owning this franchise. This will be the beginning of the 20th season, but it'll be our first without Gil Santos calling games. And to think for 36 years of the Patriots 54, he was calling the games along with his great partner, Gino, for 28 years who I agree should be in the Hall of Fame in Canton. And uh, I don't understand why not. We thank you so much. Um, and we think that's the championship broadcast team forever. But speaking of great teams, our next honoree played a significant role in many of our greatest teams. I, with a name like Brewski, I knew that the day we drafted him, he was going to become an instant fan favorite in New England. <laughs> you know, I even remember when he came into the old bubble, I, I was standing next to Parcells, and he said, who's that Italian guy down? No, he said, who's that Mexican guy <laughs> over there? Well, what I didn't know was through his own hard work, dogged determination, and remarkable resiliency, he would become one of the most iconic players in franchise history.
On the field, he was always intense, focused, and fundamentally sound. And for 13 years, he went full tilt, full time. He became a great role model for his teammates by the way he conducted himself. He became an elite NFL linebacker and earned Pro Bowl honors. But that was never his main goal. His main goal was winning football games. In his 13 NFL seasons, out of the 13 seasons he played, the Patriots had a winning record 11 of those seasons. He was a seven times team captain, an eight time division champion, a five time conference champion, and a three time Super Bowl champion. For more than a decade, he was the heart and soul of the Patriots' defense. It's no coincidence that during that decade, the, the Patriots enjoyed the most successful era of any team in NFL history. His remarkable and courageous return to the field following a stroke the first and only player, NFL player, ever to do so, only added to his iconic status here in New England. Teddy has left many indelible impressions on the franchise, including a locker room legacy of how he used to address the team after a victory. Please turn your attention to the CBS scene video board for a quick look. How we feel about coming to the NYC and getting an open name victory? Oh, yeah. How we feel about free hats and t-shirts? Oh, yeah. How we feel about making NFL history? Oh, As tonight's presenter, I want to ask you all a simple question. How do you all feel about Teddy Bruschi being inducted into the Patriots Hall of Fame? Oh, yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor and pr privilege to present this Patriots Hall of Fame jacket to one of the greatest players in franchise history, your own Teddy Bruschi. Thank you, Mr. Kraft. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, let, me, let me set the record straight, um, probably for Bill Parcells. It's Italian, half Italian, half Filipino. That's what it was. I know, I, it's easy to get mixed up, but uh, that's right. It's a nice jacket. It's a nice jacket, isn't it? The goal, the goal on the teams that I played, it, the red jacket was never the goal, and free hats and t-shirts were. <laughs> now this jacket, I don't, it probably costs a lot more than those hats and t-shirts, but free hats and t-shirts, that said you did something. That said you 
won an AFC East Divisional Championship or a Conference Championship, and hopefully you got that third set, that free hat and t-shirt that said World Champion. And we got to do that three times. So I'm honored to be here and honored to accept this jacket, and my wife tells me I look good in red anyway. You look good, babe? It looks all right? All right. I'd like to thank Gil Santos for calling every play of my career. It, it really, I enjoyed listening to him when I could. It was always on the highlights, hearing that background voice of him and Gino and Gil, that voice that I always, that I always could recognize. When I first met Gil, I didn't know him by face. I knew him by voice and I could recognize him right away. And, and, and Gil, it's, it's an absolute honor to be going in with the man that called every play of my career. Thanks, Gil. Thank you. I want to thank all the Patriots alumni that are here, all the Patriots of the past that laid the foundation for this organization because this all wasn't here a long time ago. These steps, this stadium, the hall, we had Foxborough Stadium. Now, I love Foxborough Stadium, but it wasn't Gillette Stadium. We had to drive to practice, practice outside the Rentham State School for boys. And these guys that came before us had less than that. But they still played hard. They still laid a foundation for us. And I'd like to thank all of them for the work that you put in for us to get us to where we are today. Thanks, guys. I want to thank Andre Tippett and Steve Nelson, two linebackers that, that set the standard on how to play linebacker for this organization. Coming here in Foxborough Stadium, you walk down a, you used to walk down a, a bunch of steps and there were jerseys up and they were number 56 and 57. And it was, it was Tippett and Nelson. And you knew and you heard stories of how linebacker was played by them. And it made you, it put yourself to a higher standard. Nelly, Tip, thanks a lot, fellas. Thanks, you showed us how to do it. Thanks. Other Patriots of the past, Mosi Tatupu, Steve Grogan, Sam Cunningham. I miss Mosi. Those guys set the foundation for us. Thank you for all you did. As a young kid growing up in San Francisco, California, I love to play football. Football just came naturally to me. Let me check that. Defensive football always came naturally to me. I never was that much of a quarterback or receiver or anything like that. But tackling a guy w was just natural. Being able to see a guy get a ball, wrap my arms around him and slam him to the turf, that's what I love to do. <laughs> we had a grass field outside my yard. My yard was a community field of grass back in San Francisco. We had busted sprinkler heads. We'd bust our knees open and get scraped. So we had no pads. We had no cleats. We'd rip our our t-shirts tackling each other. That was the best football of my life, right there. I remember the first tackle I ever made, and it was on my father. I was, I was only around eight years old, probably the, 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 the same age as my youngest son, Dante. I was eight years old at a park in San Francisco, California, eating at a picnic table. I was eating at the picnic table because my older brothers, Tony and Giovanni and my father, they, they wouldn't let me play because they said I was too small. Teddy, you're too young. You can't play. It's, it's us two against dad. I said, fine. I sat down, was having a sandwich. My dad was on a breakaway, and he was running away from my brothers. He was about to score a touchdown. And I was sitting there at the table, and I looked, and I saw him running behind me, and something inside of me just snapped. I got up from the picnic table, I ran to my father, caught up with him, wrapped him up by both ankles, and he dropped like a tree. <laughs> my father looked back while he was on the ground, and he was expecting Tony or Johnny, but it wasn't them, it was me. And he said, holy smoke, Teddy, why'd you do that? <laughs> and, and I think at that point, my father sort of knew he might have slightly had an idea what I would become. You see, I didn't, I didn't play organized football until I was 14 years old, and that was just by chance. I walked into my freshman orientation, and I saw a couple buddies from eighth grade, 
and they motioned over to me and said, sit down next to us, Teddy, sit down. And by their feet, there were a pair of football cleats and a water cooler. And I said, what are those for? And they looked at me and said, we're going to try out for the football team. You should come. So I went. And that's how I started. And my father, he came and saw me practice. He said, Ted, you got it. You got it. You're going to be good, Ted. You're going to be good. But you got to play linebacker. You got to be an inside linebacker, Ted. And I said, Dad, I, I don't want to play linebacker right now. My coach has me at, at uh, offensive guard and defensive tackle. It's what I was playing. No, Ted, you got to play linebacker. No, Dad, I don't want to play linebacker. So I went on through high school and played offensive guard and played defensive tackle. And then I got a scholarship to the University of Arizona where they wanted me to play defensive end. Teddy, you got to play linebacker. No, Dad, I'm good. I'm good. Dick told me, kept me at linebacker, my college football coach, one of the greatest coaches I ever had. Played me at defensive end, Dad. He wants me to play defensive end. Why do you want me to play linebacker? You're going to be a linebacker, son. I sacked the quarterback 52 times in college. No other player in NCAA history did more. I tied Derek Thomas' all-time sack record. My father said, you got to play linebacker. 1996, third round of the NFL draft. I'm at my apartment in Tucson, Arizona. You get to the third round, is when all three rounds were on the first day, and you stop watching. My family was there, my girlfriend Heidi was there, who of course she became my wife. And we were watching the TV and we got bored. Man, it wasn't fun to watch anymore, so I walked by the TV screen and at the bottom of the screen it flashed Teddy Bruschi, 86th pick, defensive end out of the University of Arizona to the New England Patriots. And, and it's quick. If you watch ESPN, it just flashes, then it goes. It was the 86th pick. And I looked at everyone and I said, I think I just got drafted by the Patriots. And they're like, what? And so we watched the ticker. One, two, three, four, all the way to 86, four, five. But it never got to 86 because the phone rang. The phone rang and it was Bill Parcells on the other line. Teddy. Yes, coach. We're going to play on special teams and middle linebacker. And I thought to myself, really? <laughs> My dad passed away in 2001 before we won our first Super Bowl. And sometimes it's hard for sons to tell their fathers this, but I think I'm going to tell, tell my father right now in front of all of you what I probably should have told him a long time ago. Dad, you were right. But so was I, <laughs> sort of. Ah. My parents divorced at an early age, and my mother, she raised us all by herself, and eventually she got remarried. And my stepfather's name was Ron Sanders, and this is a man that helped me tremendously. Ron ended up recognizing what I could do in high school, and he, dis and he researched how a kid could get from high school football to get a college scholarship. And there was something that you need, and all my boys know, you needed this highlight film. You had to put a highlight film together to put out to your college teams and send them out and look at this kid and look at that kid. And Ron helped me do that. He was at every game that I ever played. He was at every wrestling match. He was at every track meet where I triple jumped and threw the shot put and threw the discus. His name was Ron Sanders, and he did a great job of being my father at the same time, not being my father. Please give Ron Sanders a round of applause. My mother's name was Juanita. And my mom, Juanita, didn't want me to play football. I remember coming up to her the first time after that, that day on the, on the foot, first day on the football field saying, Mom, I like this, I want to play, but Mom, I need a pair of cleats. And she said, son, I'm not going to buy you a pair of cleats for this sport. You know how much cleats cost? I said, mom, I really love this. She said, no, you got to wait. Make it three days. If you last, then I'll buy you a pair of cleats. I went out there in a Via tennis shoes. 
a V of tennis shoes and a white t-shirt over my shoulder pads. Still knocking people out. Knocking them down, having fun. But my mom didn't want me to play. She said, son, that sport is dangerous. I want you to stay in the band. <laughs> hey, nothing's wrong with the band. <laughs> I started in the Catholic choir. I ended up playing clarinet. I moved to saxophone. I got my kids in music right now. Music is very important. I'm taking guitar lessons. My guitar teacher out there. What's up, man? <laughs> no, Teddy, stay in the band. Three days. Three days lasted. Oh, man. But she, she relented. She relented and bought me a pair of cleats. And I went out there and had my football cleats, and she bought me a new jersey. But I tell you, my mother, she would never watch me play. She always waited till I came home and had that tape that Ron made so she could watch it. Because when I came home and I walked through the door, she knew I didn't get hurt. So she said, all right, Teddy, I'll watch the film. And she'd watch the film. You got to be mentally tough to play this game of football. I learned all of my mental toughness from my mother. My mother could look Bill Belichick in the eyes and he would crumble. My mom passed away in 2009. Please give my mother a round of applause. Well, she bought me those cleats, white high top pony cleats, the screw-ins. They were the good ones too. And yes, I ended up playing middle linebacker and my dad was right, but that was the beginning coming here to the New England Patriots as a defensive end that had never taken a pass drop before. I was in a meeting room with Al Groh, my position coach, and he was explaining to me how to play linebacker. He said, Teddy, we're gonna go over cover two. I said, okay. As a linebacker, you line up five to seven yards deep. When you recognize pass, drop to the hook. I raised my hand. He said, yes, Teddy, you got a question? I said, yeah, where's that? Where's the hook? I didn't know where any of it was. You see, all I did in college was rush the passer. If there was a tight end, I played jam seven. If the, tight, if the tackle dropped back, I was going after the passer. That's all I did. So Al Groh had to teach me everything from scratch. Al Groh, thank you for teaching me where the hook drop was. <laughs> I like to thank Bill Parcells, my rookie year football coach. He on, I only had Bill Parcells for a year. I wish I had him more, but I only had him for a year, but he helped me lay the foundation of how to be a professional football player. Not so much football knowledge, but football survival and how you survived in this league. Teddy, players, he tell all of us, football will give you a lot of things. Zoe, you remember this. Football will give you a lot of things. You can buy a nice car. You can buy a nice house. It'll get you some fame but there are certain things you got to earn in the game of football. And you got to earn your respect and you got to earn championships. And that's what Bill Parcells taught me. And Bill, you see, Bill did a great job of doing more than that, of being so stern, because he can make you feel this big sometimes. But then he let you know he loved you. I remember one time I had a good, I had a good practice. I intercepted Drew Bledsoe, took it to the house, bad throw. And Parcells, after practice, said, Brewski, get in the car. You see, we had to drive to practice, and P Coach Parcells always drove this Cadillac El Dorado. And he put me in that car, and he talked to me about my family, he talked to me about my career, and he asked me if I had an accountant. Certain little things like that. That's what I remember from certain coaches, and he did that for me. Bill Parcells is going in the Pro Football Hall of Fame this year, and he deserves it. Give him a round of applause. Now, the next few years of my, my career was under head coach Pete Carroll. Now, we didn't, we didn't win any championships under Pete. We, went, we won some games, but we didn't win any championships. But I've got to thank Pete Carroll and his staff, like Steve Sidwell and Bo Pelini, for teaching me how to play. I was still so raw at that point. 
that I needed those three, under, three years under Pete Carroll, Steve Sidwell, Bo Pelini to become a better player and a better linebacker. Give Pete Carroll a round of applause. Thank you, Pete. All right, then a guy named Bill Belichick came in here. There we go, there we go. Coach Belichick had this easy way of making the complex very simple. You see, he had complex game plans, complex schemes, complex ideas, but when it came down to coaching a player individually, he would make it like it was black and white. This is how you do it. This is how you, this is how you perform and make it successful. It was so simple. He made the complex simple. I think that was a part of his genius, a part of why he succeeded so well, teaching football to players on a, on a, in a way that they could learn it. There were coaches that helped him do this because sometimes you got black and white with Coach Belichick and that's all you get. Sometimes you need a little gray. And certain coaches helped him do that. Romeo Cornell helped him do that, all right? Eric Mangini helped him do that. Dean Pease. Dean Pease helped him do that. Do your job, do your job, do your job. I was sick of hearing do your job for so many years in my career. But then I learned, because when you, when you play under Bill Belichick and all you hear is do your job, but year after year, it's do your job, do your job. You guys hear it, we, well, you just gotta do our job, get better, you know, one day at a time, do things like that. That's all you hear, right? And that's all we hear too. When you end up translating that, the way we became successful is we learned, veterans like myself and Willie McGinnis and Mike Vrabel, Rodney Harrison, Andrewsy, Law, Light, all of these guys, okay? I think what we did was we took doing your job to the next level because I always believed it was this by the time I finished with him. Do your job first. And once you got that down, help someone else do their job better. And when you got five guys understanding that, then you got 10 guys understanding that, 15, 20, then you got a team working together like that. Belichick may say, do your job. Veterans, we got to translate. And we did. Listen. I'm too old. <laughs> When Wes Welker hurt his knee a few years ago, blew it out when they were playing the, uh, the, the Houston Texans, I texted Wes. And I, because truly I believe when you play professional football, no career is complete without a comeback. Wes had to do that. I wanted to let him know because I learned in 2005 after my comeback from a stroke. I remember the game. I thought I was done. I thought I was finished. I remember calling my doctor, my neurologist at Massachusetts General Hospital, Dr. David Greer. I said, Doc, I want the number of the guy that has done this before because I want to know if I hit somebody, uh, is my brain going to explode? If I hit somebody, is the device in my heart going to move? I want to know, give me the number of that guy. And there was silence on the other line of the phone. And I said, Doc, what's wrong? He said, Teddy, you'd be the first. And I said, I'll call you back. I mean, I didn't know if I wanted to be that guy. But I remember the comeback game right here in this stadium in October and all the support that all of you gave me. If only you knew what was going on in my helmet, in my brain at that time. I didn't think I was doing the right thing. I did not know if this was gonna work out. But I ended up playing four more years, and I am not a stat guy, you see. I don't really keep track of a lot of, the, a lot of the professional stats that I made, but one number sticks out in my mind. It's 366. 366 tackles, that's the number of tackles I made as a stroke survivor. And I'm proud of that. I'd like to thank Spalding Rehabilitation Hospital 
and Ann McCarthy Jacobson for what they did for me and helping me get back to the field. I'd like to thank the New England Patriots training staff, Jim Whalen, Joe Van Allen, Dave Granito. I needed so many people. I needed so many people to help me do that, and I needed all of you also. Thank you for your support in that. After, after my stroke, I formed, with the, I formed a team called Teddy's Team with the American Stroke Association. They're here. I'd like to thank all of you. I'd like to thank you because you helped me answer the question that you helped me feel a way that it took me a long time to feel than to say this, that I'm proud to be a stroke survivor. Thank you for doing that, everyone. I'd like to thank Mr. Robert Kraft for forming a relationship with me that went beyond employer and employee and beyond owner and player. Mr. Kraft, how do I put this? So many conversations we had that were non-football related that I remember. I love talking football with Mr. Kraft. He'd ask me questions, I'd give him honest answers, but that wasn't what, what, what it was about or what I remember. I remember talking about my wife. I remember him telling stories about Myra, him and Myra, and how they related to me, and how when you got someone strong in your corner, like Mrs. Kraft or like Heidi, life's gonna be all right. But you, he gave me all of that and all of that support, but you could joke around with Mr. Kraft too. I mean, he was like, he was really one of the guys at times. I remember a story, it was during Thanksgiving and we were getting ready for a game. It was Wednesday before Thanksgiving and the big debate that I started on the sideline between the defense and the offense was dark meat or white meat? <laughs> what did you like to eat on the turkey? We got time and practice, we just talk about things, you know. It must have been a special teams period or something like that. So I'm there with Roosevelt Colvin. You know, other linebackers debating, some guys like dark meat, some guys like white meat, and they're talking about gravy and cutting the breast and all of this stuff, and we're really getting into it. And Mr. Kraft walks, the, walks around the middle of the field through us all. We're on the sideline. I don't know why he was in the middle of the field, but he's the owner. He can do whatever he wants. So he's walking down the middle of the field, and I said, stop, Mr. Kraft. And he looks over. And I said, dark meat or white meat? <laughs> and he looks over. He gives a wink, and he says, dark meat. And the place just explodes. <laughs> all the dark meat guys are high-fiving. All the white meat guys are just, oh, yeah, get out of here. That's the kind of owner he was. And thank you for forming that relationship with me. And I know you try to do that with a lot of your players, and that's what makes you so special. Thank you very much, Mr. Kraft. Okay. Let me talk about all of you, okay? There's two words I can use to describe the fans of the New England Patriots. Listen closely. Passion and pressure. I've thought about this long and hard too because I always felt your passion. You could feel your love. You could feel your hate. You could feel it all. Your passion was evident in the stadium, through the radio airwaves, through the TV, through the articles. I could always feel your passion. I love that about all of you. But there was an element of pressure that you always applied, and I always respected that. I remember a play in 1996 when I was a rookie. We were playing the Denver Broncos. The call was brown right. It was a fake punt. Zoe was laughing already. <laughs> the call was, the, the, the ball, the, the, the punter was Tom Tupa. He was supposed to throw it to Colin Brown on a little seven route, okay? Corwin was covered. Everybody knew to cover Corwin on fake punts. So there was me playing wing, and I'm the outlet. Three yards, four yards, just out there. Tupa threw it to me, and I dropped it. And we lost, and we got our butts kicked. I remember the next day in the Boston Globe seeing, a, seeing an article Brewski blows it, whatever the headline was, but I remember the picture. I remember you guys making me feel like a bum. That's okay, that's all right. I remember the article, the picture of me on the ground, the picture of me dropping the punt. And right there, I didn't know if I was cut out for this business. That's 
what I'm talking about. And I dig that about you guys. <laughs> but I saved that article for the next 10 years. And I looked at it occasionally. And I told myself I'd never be that guy again. I'd never be that guy that caused this team to lose. And I never was again. Thank you for your passion and thank you for your pressure. Okay, okay, hey. I love you too. Listen, maybe one day I'll feel a little more comfortable in this red jacket, okay? Now, you have to forgive me if it takes a little time. You see, when we won hats and t-shirts, there was one in every player's locker. And every teammate got a hat. And every teammate got a t-shirt that said they did something, that they accomplished something. I'm the only player up here today getting a jacket and I feel conflicted. So I will eagerly await many of my teammates to join me up here and wearing this red jacket. I love you all, thank you very much. Thank you. Teddy Bruschi. All right, at this time, I'd like to invite Scott Zolak to return for another panel discussion. Four of uh, Teddy's teammates, former teammates, who contributed to those three Super Bowl teams. Round of applause for Patriots Hall of Famer Troy Brown, Ty Law, Matt Light, Joe Andrusi. And while they're settling into their chairs, one former teammate who wanted to be here but had a work conflict at NFL Network wanted to send a message to Teddy. So if you'd turn your attention to the CBS scene video boards for this message. Teddy, what's up, brother? I want to apologize, man, first for not being there because of work obligations. I couldn't be there to share this special moment with you. Second, I want to congratulate you on your induction of the Patriots Hall of Fame. It was a pleasure to go to work with you each and every day, week in and week out, going to battle, sharing some special times. You're a great leader. You're a true professional, a great example for a lot of players across this league. You was a great friend, a great brother, and a great man on and off the field. The times we spent was special. Everything, all the success that we had in New England was because we had guys like you on that team. Again, man, I just want to say I congratulate you. You deserve it. And uh, I wish I could be there to share this special moment. I love you, brother. Congrats. Willie McGinnis. It's amazing when you listen to Teddy Bruschi talk and you inject a little passion into whatever your work is or whatever your walk in life is. If that doesn't speak about the brand what this organization is built on, I don't know what is. All right, Teddy, 13 years. I know there's a lot of big moments, your most memorable moment as a Patriot. I know we could be here for hours, as you were already here for like it's 45 minutes. It's similar to minutes. Gills, it's the first. You always remember the first. I mean, and it wasn't it special just because, it was the special because it was the first for the franchise. Because before we won that championship, I don't know if people believed we could. They didn't. You know, New England had never done it before. So to break through that wall and say, yes, we can. Yes, we can. And we'll not only do it once, we'll do it twice and we'll do it again. But that first one has to be done. And that's the first one is, it's the, first one is the most difficult to get. I think we all know that. But it was that first one that really started everything is something that whole season I'll, I'll, I'll never forget. All right, good stuff. I'm going to go to Troy Brown here. Um, Troy. Where were you? All right, Patriot Hall of Famer, Troy Brown. Give it up for Troy. See, no shocker. I think Troy picked Jay-Z last year to get introduced. Teddy, of course, goes with the old school football music. Pulled that out of the archives. Troy, where were you when you heard Teddy Bruschi had a stroke? And talk about that game in 2005 when he came back. 
Uh, I was I was back in West Virginia, and I don't know. I think I was at the time like 32, 33 years old, and I'm hearing all this come through, you know, on the news that Teddy had a stroke, and then probably talking to Stacy and guys like that, and getting the information and what went on, and you know, just an unbelievable thing. Like we just won a Super Bowl. Teddy just went to the Pro Bowl. It's not possible that Teddy Bruschi at 30, 31, whatever he was, had a stroke. Uh, how how is that even possible? So it was. Pretty unbelievable for me to even, you know, picture Teddy Bruschi as big and strong and as tough as he is having a stroke at that age. And I remember myself calling, getting on the phone and calling my doctor. And I, dude, I need a full physical. I need it all. I need, you know, rectal exams, all that, prostate, everything. Give me everything. You know, and, and I really did. I got on the phone and I called him and I went in and he said, you, you're really too young for all this. But I'm like, yeah, but you heard the news about, news about Teddy Bruschi having a stroke you know he's younger than me and he kind of laughed about it and he performed all that stuff on me and it was you know quite uncomfortable stuff that he performed on me but I got it all done because I knew how big and tough this guy was and he, he suffered a stroke but then watching him come back you know in, in 2005 from the stroke because I, I really miss Teddy because before every game he always gave me four head butts in the head you know and the smell yeah, salts. He had those smell salts. He always had. He always stayed down in that corner. Exactly. He always talked right, to himself. Right in, right in the corner. And I didn't have that for what eight weeks of the of the season. And and all of a sudden, you know, I don't know what was going through Teddy's mind either when he came back from that stroke. But he didn't forget to come get me and give me those head butts. You know, and I, that's when I knew that Teddy Bruschi was back. I remember the crowd roaring when he came out of the tunnel, and in typical Bruschi fashion, just uh, inserting so much passion back into the Patriot way of playing football. All right, let's give it up for Ty Law. We're going to go with Ty Law next. This should be fun. All right, when we traveled, or when we did travel, there's usually five or six buses out there. The cool bus is what? Bus three, right? Teddy was never on that bus, or was he? You guys were together with us when Teddy first was drafted here. You know, get the whole Eric Estrada, the California Highway Patrol comparisons. <laughs> give me a good Teddy Bruschi story, Ty Law. Teddy, for one, he, as great as a player as he was, he wasn't one of the cool kids. You know what I mean? He wasn't one of the kind of like, yeah, let's go hang out with, with Brewski. He, you know, he, was, he, did, he did his own thing. We know we can count on him on the football, but he might not get all the jokes that go on. So Teddy might not get them all. But unlike the rest of these guys up here, which they'd probably be a little jealous, me and Teddy had a special bond. And our, it's not, a, it's not one moment, it's moments seven years worth of moments that we're playing in games, game in and game out, four to five times a game, me and Teddy Bruschi had a moment because I was one to never go back into the huddle too much. And, and Teddy, he was my eyes and ears. I was so tired. I'm always, okay, let me worry about where is Marvin Harrison? Where is Keyshawn? Where is these guys at? You know, just tell me to call. But it got to a point where I was Tired. I'm talking about I'm tired as hell. So I look over, you know, to go to Belichick and Rack. I was like, man, call cover two, man. I'm tired. I'm hurting. Just like Teddy say, do your eff effing job, Ty. Do your effing job. That's Belichick. Go to Rack. You wanted him? Take him. So I'm like, man. So Teddy, as only Teddy can do, go in there. I'm blue out. And Teddy's like, Ty, you all right? I said, hell no. I'm tired. He was like, I got you. Teddy will go out there and change the defense just to help me out. And, and then now it's a third down. You know, he want to call it. But I said, we don't need it. I'm tired. We comes out the game and they're punting. Comes over there. Here comes Rack. Bill, who changed the effing play in his name? That was me, coach. G good job, Teddy. Good job, Teddy. Good job. <laughs> I'm sitting there like... Now, if that was me, I'd have been packing my bags. I'd have been in the showers. I ain't on the field no more. But now it, 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 the light went off in my head. So the next time I'm tired, I ain't even going to go to Belichick. I ain't going to say nothing to rap. I'm just going to give Teddy the look. <laughs> and he got me. And, I mean, throughout my career, playing with Teddy Bruschi, he's helped me so much that he could just give me the look. And not only does he have to worry about his own job, he was always looking out 
for me because if I ever did come to the huddle, he knew something was up. And he had the authority, unlike anybody else on that defense, to change it, to give his old man Ty Law a breather. So I appreciate that, man, from the bottom of my heart. It was a pleasure playing with you, man. One of the smartest guys that I've ever, ever played with. I mean, he knew everybody. And I'll tell you one more thing. We had these tests every week. And for me, I just put in what I had to do. I wasn't worried about that corner, that safety, that linebacker. You know why I wasn't worried about it? Because I didn't know anyway. <laughs> hey, who I got, coach? I play that cat coverage. That's what I'm used to. You, you know, cat. I got that cat. Got that cat. Okay, that's all, that's all I need to know. <laughs> but if it, Brewski, now you put his text test next to anybody's, and he's going to put us all to shame because he got everybody filled in. He got everybody where they're supposed to hook, where they're supposed to drop, where they're supposed to go up on the line. I'm like, how do you have all the time to figure out what everybody else is doing? Because my philosophy, if I'm over here, I know where my immediate help is at. I don't need to know what the defensive end on the right side and the linebacker and the tackle is doing because that ain't helping me at all. So Teddy Bruschi probably knew just as much or more than the coaches that actually were, was teaching us. And that goes to show you not only was he a great football player, but he was also a great student of the game and one of the best that I've been around. And he's helped my career tremendously because he was able to do that for me. And he collected a check every week like the rest of us. But Mr. Crab, he should have got two because he was also a coach out there. <laughs> All right, Matt Light requested to go last. So I'm going to go to Joanne Jersey. The cool thing about this question, multiple Super Bowls between all of you. Pick out your favorite Brewski Super Bowl moment. Why, when was it, which one? Well, let me quickly start coming here in 2000. You know, Ty talks about that look. Brewski, you know, ends with a vowel. Andrewsy ends with another vowel. So we kind of had that connection, me being on the offensive side, Teddy being on the defensive side. We give a little wink certain times before the game where we don't want to smack each other up. I was, I was chin straps weren't buckled, not ready to break a nose out there. Trying to get a little lather going, but don't want to kill each other before the game. So we had that little connection. Even sometimes, you know, I don't want to say it too loud, sometimes during practice we give a little wink every now and then on a Friday or something. But something to have a little connection where, where we don't want to kill each other and, and hurt ourselves. But knowing getting here in 2000 and you know, seeing that big smile, you can see it on all the highlight films. He's got a smile from ear to ear. He's a big kid. He's a big kid in the locker room, you know, jokes, this and that. I'm sure Heidi will probably agree with me, Teddy. You're her fourth son, right? <laughs> uh, but how he perceived himself in that locker room on everything that you saw the videos, you saw the video of uh, how he ended every practice, he was that quiet leader, you know, until we won the game, of course. But that leader that was running behind the offense, doing the uh, gases over and back with Ty, Willie, and a whole bunch of guys back and forth, trying to get ready, trying to better themselves because they wanted to earn that free hat and T-shirt, as well as us, back and forth. But getting there and being able to push ourselves to follow his leadership on everything he did, whether it was in the locker room, the weight room, on the field, get there in 2001. You know, once again, following Gil, you know, Favorite one for all of us, probably a lot of us in this room here. And being able to go out there, watch Adam kick that ball up there, and then turn around. I think there's a picture of it somewhere. One of the fondest moments is Brewski hugging that trophy. I think there's still lip marks, and you know, he's kissing it, hugging it, caressing it, and he wouldn't give it to anybody. He was running around. You guys remember, he's running around on the field, and he wouldn't give it to anybody. He's holding on to it, and it, I think he walked off the field with it. So. Not sure how it got back here, but uh, somebody got it back. But uh, some of the greatest moments, we've had so many to talk about, uh, you know, from family get-togethers, holiday to get, uh, get-togethers. You know, a lot of great moments with Teddy. Truly an honor to be up here on the stage, you know, telling you stories about him. But congratulations, Teddy, and to Gil. Good stuff, Joe. Teddy, 
you're not talking yet. You're going to wrap it up. We got to go to Matt Light. All right, what do you got on Mr. Brewski? This should be pretty good. You know, uh, golly, so many ways to go right now. I mean, I have longed for this moment. What says family more than what you've seen up here today? Tell me that. What says family more than what we've seen today? I mean, I haven't gotten this excited in years, okay? I mean, listening to the speech, Teddy, I love you. I, I don't know how I could have possibly forgotten how good it was, but every moment out there before games, every time we take that field, any pivotal moment, it had his signature on it. And what says family more than to hear a guy get up and tell you how it all happened and, and pay you know, respects to all the people before him. What says family more than that? What says family more than everything that we've got here right now? I mean, it's an honor to be here, man. I think of you and so many of these memories come back. And I'll tell you another thing. As a rookie, I can remember coming in and the baddest dudes on the block happened to be in that linebacker room, all right? I'm talking about Willie Mack. If you got in his shower, watch out, things weren't good, all right? <laughs> And by the way, there wasn't a name tag on it. It was, hey, it's a linebacker shower. And, but guess what? That's, that's his. You don't go near that, Rook. And if I made a mistake, I promise you, Teddy would let everybody know, hey, Rook, what are you doing? Are you serious? Get out of here. Get out of here. Get out of here. You're gone. Get out of here. I mean, I can tell you there was a lot of pressure. But just going back to the family thing, there's always an uncle or an aunt or somebody that keeps you in place, right? And we always had that. And we always had it from that linebacker crew, and we always had it from Teddy, day in and day out. And the passion that you guys saw in his speech is what we lived each and every day as a unit, as a group. And we might not always liked each other, offense and defensive guys, but I'll tell you what, family, it's all about respect, and I respect the heck out of what he did and what he stood for. But I'm gonna tell you one thing though, all right? I'm gonna tell you one thing. He left, and all the lessons that I gleaned from him over the years and the rest of the guys that were you know, just pivotal in making this such a championship organization, there was one thing that he left without giving anybody clue as to how you could do it. And you saw a little bit of it there. And I was the guy that I can remember somebody saying, all right, who's going to break it down, man? I mean, Teddy's not here anymore. Who's going to break it down? Oh, light, break it down. Light, you got a big mouth. You always got something to say. First of all, I couldn't stumble through any of that stuff you did. You came up with things that rhymed at the drop of a dime. I can't do it to this day. I never will, but it kind of worked right there, didn't it? <laughs> all I'm saying is, I got up there, and I don't even know what came out of my mouth, but when I gave the, oh, no, no, sir, oh, you know what? Forget it, man. We're going back home. So before I leave, baby, one last time, at least with these guys and the rest of our family, we got to break it down. You got to show us how it's done. You got to show us how it's done. Come on, bro. You want to break it down real quick? Uh, yeah. Heck yeah. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. Everybody put it in. No, we got to get it up high. We got it up high. All right. We gonna, hold, on, hold on a second. Hold on a second. Hold on a second. One, one, one thing, one thing, one second, one second. Because so, that's going to be the last thing. You yeah, see, that's the thing I'm going to break yeah, down. Okay, so, okay. Matt talked about family. And there's one thing that I wanted to finish with in this setting with my family here, my football family here. And I know I don't have to do this. And I know I don't. And that's to thank my wife, Heidi. All right? Because, Hyde, there are certain things that you just know. There are certain things that you know and I know. Home team is what we always talk about. TJ, Rex, Dante, all of us in our home team because once we get home and this jacket comes off, it's just dad. And I still gotta be a husband and a father and I wanna thank you for helping me be such a good husband and father. You are the best wife a man could ever ask for and I love you very much, baby. And that's what I really wanna finish with. So everybody, bring it up, come on. We're patriots, we all are patriots. So I'm gonna ask you all, the word is home team. How we feel about being a part of the home team? Oh, oh yeah! Teddy Bruschi. Back over to John Rook. All right guys, stay right where you are. 
We have the players stay right here for a moment because we have, before we conclude, one more person would like, we'd like to invite up here to say a few words. At his retirement, this man called Teddy the perfect player. So please welcome Patriots head coach Bill Belichick. Thank you. It's, uh, it's a great, great honor to be here at, uh, sit down, fellas. Jeez, come on. <laughs> great honor to be here at uh, Teddy's induction and Gil's. Uh, Gil made all, all those great calls for so many years. And, uh, you know, it's a great honor to be up here. It was, it's a real privilege to have coached Teddy Bruski. And, uh, you know, I've said many times that. Uh, the things that stand out about Teddy are his, and he's referred to him, his passion for football and his instinctiveness. And um, it's funny, you know, when we drafted him in 1996, uh, you know, Bill, after we made the pick, walked in and said, you know, we, we took Bruski to defensive lineman from Arizona, but we're going to make him a linebacker. And uh, the defensive staff then was myself, uh, Al Groh, Romeo Cornell, and Dante Scarnecchia. And so we sat around, uh, and first thing we kind of said was, all right, we got him now. What are we going to do with him? <laughs> uh, it turned out that uh, the first rookie minicamp we came in there, like Teddy said, he's Al's teaching them, you know, kind of where to huddle is, where to go, what to do. And uh, one thing we came out of that uh, first rookie minicamp saying, which was really a surprise because Teddy was a defensive lineman, is, you know what, the guy can catch. He's got good hands. He can catch. So as we've seen, you know, he was a great interceptor for us and uh, turned that into, you know, a lot of skill. But that later on that year, of course, he was. Uh, you know, wasn't a big special teams player in college because he was sacking a quarterback 52 times in his career, and uh, he became one of our best special teams players. He uh, also had two sacks in the Super Bowl against Green Bay and went on to be a, you know, become a great defensive player for the New England Patriots. And I've said many times that there's no player that I've ever coached that epitomizes the football player. You know, when I look at the word football player in the dictionary, you just see Teddy Bruschi's picture there. That's... That's the best way I can put it. And, uh, you know, some of the comments that Matt Light just made, you just, they're so true. He had so much passion. It didn't matter whether we were doing sprints, lifting weights, uh, preseason game, championship game. You know, he had that same energy, that same team spirit. Uh, he brought it out there every single day, and, and it was awesome. And, you know, I think about a lot of the, the great calls that, that Gill has made through the years on the Patriots, and we think about a lot of the great plays that Bruski was involved in. Think about when he tore the ball away from Edger and James against the Colts. Think about, think about the play in the Detroit game Thanksgiving Day when he intercepted the uh, pass in empty formation and ran it back for a touchdown. You think, about, you think about the interception he had in the Miami game in the snow that sealed the championship for us. But the play that I'll never forget, the play that led to that 2001 championship, the play that I'll never forget in the snow game was second and three. And they ran an off-tackle play. We, we were in a bad defense. It, was, it wasn't good. And there was a hole there. I'm telling you, it was as wide as this stage. That's how big it was. And here comes John Ritchie, and here comes Charlie Gardner with the ball right behind him. And we got one guy and that's Bruski. And he stepped in there, he hit Richie, he tackled Gardner, and it was third and one. And I'm telling you, without that play, there wouldn't have been a lot of those other plays that happened that year. That was, that was the biggest play, probably the biggest play of the season. And uh, we remember a lot of the other ones, but I'll tell you, that's one that I'll never, ever forget. And so, you know, a lot of the guys that are in that, that room back there behind me, uh, great players for this organization, but Teddy Bruschi so deserves to be there. He's such a champion in every sense of the word. He's, he's the epitome of a football player, and it's such an honor and a privilege to have coached Teddy Bruschi. Thank you, Teddy.
And I'll just say one last thing that, you know, we throw the word around a lot. You know, there's great players. There's great players. And there's great players. And Teddy Bruschi was a great, great football player because of his passion, his love, his team attitude toward the game are all second to none. Teddy, congratulations. Thank you. Coach, thank you. And at this time, I'd like to invite our honorees tonight, Teddy Bruschi and Gil Santos, their presenters, Mr. Robert and Jonathan Kraft, and all the Patriots Hall of Famers to return to the stage for a few photos. And also at this time, if we could ask our guests from the Armed Forces to return a few of our prized possessions and lead our Hall of Famers to their reception. I just want to thank Robert, Jonathan, and the entire Kraft family, uh, my family, my friends, my relatives, everybody that came here today, and all of you people who enjoyed the ceremonies, I hope, and are enjoying a little party now. Have a good time. It was, it is the highlight of my 50 plus years in broadcasting. Can't ask for any better than that. Thank you very much. So then for other inductee Teddy Bruschi, a story that isn't known is that after Teddy had his stroke, uh, I remember meeting with Heidi and Teddy, and I deep down really, I want to win more than anything, but I didn't want to win to a point uh, where someone we cared about deeply could get injured on in our field, and we knowingly participated in it. So I actually, in a subtle kind of way, try to talk him out of it and be sure. And I remember seeing Heidi's face too. And so we made a deal that we were going to, he would go down to New York and see independent doctors who were not Patriot fans, who were actually Giant or Jet fans. Um, and we have a saying in our family when we're doing important things, we, cut, we measure nine times and cut once. And I asked the two of them to do that. And um, we're sure happy he measured, I think, 11 times. And he made the right decision. And our New York doctor friends also advised us properly. So it's my great honor to give our great pal, Teddy, this watch uh, from only Hall of Famers have. I don't know how many times I heard that. Measure nine times and cut once. Give me my helmet. Measure nine times and cut once. I'm ready to play. Measure nine times and cut once. I'm ready. I wasn't. And Mr. Kraft really made sure that I was okay. And I appreciate that, Mr. Kraft. This has been a great day. This has been a special day for Heidi, TJ, Rex, and Dante. I think their, their highlight's been on the field, being on the field and seeing the guys. My son TJ and Rex, they're big time into fantasy football. So they, I think they were getting uh, some, some scouting reports on who to draft from the New England Patriots. <laughs> All right. This watch will tell time, you know, and, I, and there's one thing I think it's time for. And I think it's time for the captains of this team, Gerard Mayo, Vince Wilfork, Tom Brady, Matthew Slater, Logan Mankins, it's time, Devin McCourty, it's time for the captains of this team to bring a championship back to New England. And I think they can do that this year. I hope they do. I'm going to enjoy watching this season. I love this team with all my heart. Thank you very much. <laughs>